and I am a member of the Ad <coughs> Planning Committee that creates uh, the forums. And I am, it's a pleasure to see so many people here who are interested in learning a little bit more about our Nevada tribes. Uh, before we get started, a couple of things, emergency exits. There's one here and then back out where you came from. If you need a restroom, you go out the hallway and then there to my left, <laughs> which would probably be your left too. Um, and you can go there and there are some refreshments and snacks uh, available for donations as well. Before we get started with tonight's presentation, uh, I've been asked to share information about our October meeting. Our October meeting uh, topic is medical research and breakthroughs at UNR Med School, fascinating research of rare muscle diseases like muscular dystrophy, diagnoses, therapies, and in immunology. And the um, speakers are from the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine, Dr. Dean Birkin, who is a professor of pharmacology, and Dr. Ryan Wubbles, who is a research assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology, and then also Dr. Kenneth Hunter, who is a professor of immunology at UNR. So we have some outstanding research that's being conducted at um, UNR, so we thought we would share information about some of the pioneer research that is being done. So tonight, um, as advertised, tonight is an opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about the past, present, and future of the Nevada tribes. And it's a glimpse into um, the Nevada Native American culture. There's going to be several speakers, including those that are up here, but then I understand there will also be some speakers coming um, from the audience as well on specific topics. So let me just share with you who the speakers are here at the front. Um, First is Stacy Montooth, and you might have seen an article in the Nevada Appeal recently about her appointment as the Executive Director of the Nevada Indian Commission, um, and her first start date was on September 1, so she really is a newbie in the job. A member of the Walker River Paiute Tribe, she serves as the liaison between the state and the 27 tribal communities in Nevada. I have tried to work with, say, 10 different groups, so I would say 27 is quite a challenge. <laughs> uh, she is a graduate of Churchill County High School and the University of Missouri's School of Journalism. She has spent over a decade working in community relations and was the first public information officer for the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. Brian Wadsworth will be our second speaker, and he is a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe and currently serves as a commissioner on the Nevada Indian Commission. He graduated from University of Reno with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and from Gonzaga University with a Master of Business Administration in American Indian Entrepreneurship. He proudly served on the Pyramid Lake Junior Senior High School Board of Education and as a Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribal Council member. And next to uh, Brian and following him in a presentation is Stacy Montooth. No, sorry. <laughs> Can't even get it straight when I've got it up here. Uh, is Marla McDade Williams. And Marla is a member of the Timok tribe of the Western Shoshone. Was that correct, Marla, or close? Okay. Marla has also served as a commissioner with the Nevada Indian Commission 
advocating for tribal consultation with state agencies and ways to empower tribes to benefit from Nevada tourism opportunities. She is also a lobbyist with Strategies 360 and works with her team to represent the Reno Sparks Indian Colony to protect um, cultural resources and the rights of tribes in uh, Nevada. She earned her bachelor's degree in political science from Washington State University and served as an intern and staff to then Washington State Senator Patty Murray during that time. Ms. McDade Williams went on to receive a master's degree in public administration from the University of Reno. And the fourth person sitting at the table is Helen Fillmore. And Helen is a council member with the Washoe Tribe and was elected in November. She currently works at the University of Nevada, Reno, as a researcher for native waters in arid lands. And she is a graduate of UNR in hydrology. So please help me give a warm welcome to our speakers and their assistants. Stacy Montooth, my name is Ne Agai Takada. Good evening. I'm Stacy Montooth, a Waka River Paiute. I'm the eldest daughter of Al and Deanna Montooth, and I'm the eldest granddaughter of Ramon and Margaret Osagera. You see, in my culture, when you meet someone new, you just don't shake hands. You tell them a little bit about yourself. So when I tell you I'm a Walker River Paiute, if you know Indian country, then you're going to know, oh, that's Stacy. She's from Sure. She's a trout eater. Because in traditional times, the Great Basin Native Americans often referred to themselves by what they ate. Earlier, I introduced myself, a guy to cut up, trout eater. Our relatives in Stillwater call themselves doi du cutta. That's cattail eaters. The Summit Lake people, they're the rock chuck eaters. Kid it to cut up. And when I tell you that I'm the eldest daughter, again, if you know Indian country, you'll know based on my birth order, in traditional times, I would have been responsible for food storage. In the Great Basin, that was a vital, very lofty task for the survival of my ancestors. You see, our ancestors were so in tune with their environment, they knew of Mother Earth so well that they followed the food. The Numa, Nui, and Washishi people, we didn't homestead. We didn't stay in one place for very long. We followed the food. For my people who were attached to the Walker River and Walker Lake, about this time of year, we'd be scouting for pine nuts. This was a huge sustenance for our people. In fact, in our ancient ways, in the spring, after spearing and netting the Lahontan cutthroat trout, my Paiute band would move from the mouth of the Walker River northeast to what's now called Yarrington or Smith Valley, that area would just be lousy with choke cherries and other sweet delights. From that region, we'd move on, actually, just down the highway from this building, out to Washoe Lake. Our oral stories tell us that Washoe Lake used to be so packed with rabbits and other small game, our tribes, our people would not just feast, but those small games would help us with our blankets, with small cooking instruments, even weapons in our regalia. Today, there are still over 150 edible plants and roots in that valley. In the fall, right about this time, our next step stop would be the Carson and Sierra Mountains. This lifestyle 
is so vital to your understanding, it actually leads to a lot of modern misconceptions. Again, our ancestors, they weren't nomadic. They weren't wanderers. We followed the food. We had well thought out specific travel patterns. And this was because, again, we were so in tune with Mother Earth. We had a oneness with our environment. <coughs> Newcomers didn't understand this. They considered our home a rigid, arid, desolate place. Non-natives didn't understand that we had a connection with the land. Land ownership, literally and figuratively, was a foreign concept to our people. Even to this day, many Native Americans consider land a natural resource. It's like the water, the air, the time. There's enough for everybody. No one's supposed to be able to control, own, or regulate a natural resource. This is a distinction that still actually causes issues today. So back to my introduction. When I tell you I'm the oldest granddaughter, and again, if you know Indian country, you'll know that based on my birth order and my gender, I'm responsible for the health care of the elders in my family. And in fact, that's exactly what brought me back to northern Nevada. My beautiful 93-year-old grandmother has slowed down a bit. My mother is a senior, and she needs a little extra help. So I returned to northern Nevada about 10 years ago, and I resumed my traditional duties. I'm here this evening because I'm the newly appointed executive director of the Nevada Indian Commission. Again, this is a state position in which I serve as the liaison from Governor Sisolak to the 27 Nevada tribes. For my portion of tonight's presentation, I want to share some basic information about our tribal government in its current system and the reservation. Got a little behind. So we have three main tribal groups which historically have made their home in the Great Basin. That's the Paiute, the Shoshone, and the Washoe. Now all tribes in Nevada are federally recognized, which means, like countries around this planet, we own government-to-government -government relationships with the United States. This means that the federal government recognizes our sovereignty. It's a big word, sovereignty. Right. Sovereignty. The first peoples of this land, these rights were endowed from the Creator. That is, that we get to govern ourselves. So in very simple terms, there are 27, 20, excuse me, 27 nations, each with their own laws, their own ordinances, their own constitutions, their own court systems, their own leadership models, and the like, all within the Silver State. Today, most tribes use a majority wins election system and they operate their councils like a legislative branch, a lot like county commissions or city council. Further, the 32 reservations or colonies in Nevada, those specifically are lands that were set aside, they were designated or they were reserved for indigenous people. These lands were not and cannot be given back. Currently, there are 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States, and most often, reservations have been established when respective tribes reserved land for their people while legally relinquishing other lands through treaties. Again, with that acknowledgement of sovereignty, each tribal nation has the power to enter into a treaty, an international legal binding contract, which capitulates that the tribes are inherent to the land. That's huge for us. We're inherent to the land. So what I want to emphasize tonight is that throughout the Great Basin, since time immemorial, or if you embrace non-native science, at minimum, 11,000 years ago, my ancestors enjoyed a stable lifestyle with a beautiful culture, 
songs, prayers, dances, language, unique attire. These persisted until Europeans and early American citizens entered into our ancestral lands, and that was in the late 1770s. That has forever changed our existence. Our existence, which was always based on movement. So one little tidbit I'd like to leave you with for any history buffs in the audience. You might be interested to know that Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, he passed the Enabling Act. And that act allowed Nevada to become a state on, help me out. October 31st, 1864. So at that time, in this territory, we didn't meet the population requirements for statehood, but President Lincoln allowed for American Indians to be in that population count. So, in Nevada, Native Americans not only were critical contributors to statehood, but my ancestors gained state citizenship in 1864. That's 60 years before our people gained United States citizenship. So to tell you a little bit more about the resiliency of, of our tribes, I'm going to pass this on to uh, my colleague Brian, and he'll talk a little bit about Stewart Indian School and the Nevada Indian Commission. And I want to just close out with a few slides. I thought it important just to show you what everyday Native Americans in the Great Basin look like. Here we have a very well-known basis. We have veterans. Our veterans, American Indians, serve in the military branches per capita more than any other ethnicity in the country. We have a ton of amazing athletes. We have cookers. We have activists. We have a, a nationally known artist. We have amazing runners. We have a little guy that wants to help his family in the kitchen. Amazing fathers. Again, soldiers. This young man is actually a member of his tribe's tribal council. We've got bike fairs. We have entertainment in our community. The man in the bottom left, Mr. Donovan, was fighting the hungry fire yesterday. Maybe my favorite picture, this young woman in her jingle dress playing soccer. We have graduates and we have medical school students. Again, veterans, elders, elders, and artists. Students, small business owners. We have folks that never miss Memorial and Veterans Day. And then we have our youth. I included in my PowerPoint acknowledgments of all the people that helped me put this slide presentation together. And it's my understanding that if you're interested, you can request a copy and I'd be happy to share it with you. So with no further ado, would you help me welcome Brian Wadsworth? Um, good evening, my friends. My name is Brian Wadsworth, and I am a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. And thank you, Stacy, for the introduction. And so, um, as Stacy mentioned during her presentations, <clears throat> the Great Basin's tribe that we call ourselves is, is what our sustenance was. And so, um, my tribe, we have the, the Kuiwi fish, so we're called the Kuiwi Dakota. And the Kuiwi fish is a fish that's endemic to Pyramid Lake out, um, out, out here in northern Nevada. And it's the only place in the world where you'll find the Kuiwi fish, and that's what my, my ancestors, and that's what we eat, eat today. And so my presentation is going to be on the tribal resilience um, in Nevada for the sovereign nations and for the Native American people here in the state. And again, my name is Brian Wadsworth, and I am also a member of the, or commissioner, on the Nevada Indian Commission. 
So just a little bit about myself. Um, as, as I mentioned, I'm from the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe here in Northern Nevada. And I currently work for the state of Nevada in the governor's finance office as an auditor. And I've been with the state since 2017. And I started with the Nevada Department of Transportation um, in their audit division. But prior to working for the state of Nevada, I worked, worked, worked for my tribe out at Pyramid Lake. And I started there back in 2012. And I started working in human resources. And then after, and then throughout my last position with the tribe was as the executive director for the Pyramid Lake Housing Authority. And um, as was mentioned during my introduction, I'm a former tribal council member. I served four years on the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribal Council as a tribal council member, as well as I was elected to serve on the Pyramid Lake Senior and Junior High School Board of Education. I spent four years on the board, three years as board chairman, and then one year as the, as the board secretary. So as Stacy had mentioned, my presentation is going to be on the Story Indian School as well as the Nevada Indian Commission. So my first part of the presentation will be a brief introduction to, um, to the Nevada Indian Commission. So the Nevada Indian Commission was established in 1965 and it was established to be as a liaison for the governor to the 27 sovereign nations here in the state. And I just wanted to make a, a quick disclaimer as, um, as the role of the Nevada Indian Commission and our role in interacting with, with the tribes here in Nevada. We do not have any regulatory authority over the sovereign nations here in the state. As Stacy had mentioned, they are they're, they're sovereign nations, so each, each tribe has their own tribal government, and each tribal government has those rights to have that government-to-government -government relationship, not only with the federal government, but also at the state level. So on the Nevada Indian Commission, we really strive to be uh, an asset and, and a tool for the tribes to be able to interact with the different state agencies, as well as to interact with the governor, as well as for the governor to interact with the tribes or different state agencies to interact with the various tribes here in the state. But in any sense, any, any of the tribes could interact directly. They could just bypass us and not even use us. But we really tried to be a, a tool for the tribes. And so we are housed within the Nevada Department of Tourism and Cultural Affairs. So we are a part of the state government structure. And we are comprised of a five-member commission. We have three members that are American Indians, and then two from the general public. And then we do have five full-time staff located within the Nevada Indian Commission, um, one being our new executive director, Ms. Stacy Montooth. And she, is, she was appointed by the governor, as well as serves on his cabinet. And so here we have the mission of the Nevada Indian Commission, and that's to ensure the well-being of American Indians and Alaska Native citizens statewide through development and enhancement of the government-to-government -government relationship between the state of Nevada and the sovereign nations in Nevada, and through education for a greater cultural understanding of the state's first citizens. And so the next couple of slides are going to be um, about the various work and accomplishments that we do with the Nevada Indian Commission and how we fulfill, fulfill that mission of, of being a liaison between, between the sovereign nations here in the state of Nevada, as well as with the, the government. So again, we are a liaison between the state and the 27 sovereign nations here. And again, I just want to reiterate the fact, or the point, that within the Nevada Indian Commission, we do not have any regulatory authority over, over the tribal governments here in Nevada. Again, we really strive to be a tool for the governments to kind of create that bridge between the state government and the various tribal governments. And we assist state agencies and tribes on issues affecting the sovereign nations in Nevada. So we also want to be an asset for, for the various state agencies um, we, we do get requests from different from various agencies within the state on better ways to engage um, with the various tribal communities because each tribal government they are they're different they have their own laws as, as Stacy had mentioned and a lot of times they're in various geographical parts and a lot of tribes are located in very rural areas and so sometimes it's kind of hard to for the state agencies to communicate with all the different tribes so as as, as I'm going to keep saying Within the Nevada Indian Commission, we really want to be an asset and a tool for, for both state agencies as well as the tribal governments. And then to provide the appropriate network and serve as the point of access for tribes to state government programs and policies. And so this, this picture here uh, was taken last year. So the Nevada Indian Commission made it one of its goals to visit, to visit all the different areas and to visit the different, different tribes here in the state of Nevada. So we held several forums in various parts of the state to be able to engage 
and interact and actually have open discussions with with various tribal leaders as well as tribal community members for to get input from the tribal communities on ways that the Nevada Indian Commission can assist all the tribes. And so we were able to compile a pretty broad list of the various issues and, and priorities that the different tribal nations have, have here in the state. And so we'll, we'll be, in the future, better able to utilize that and be able to you know, work with the government, work with the state agencies to better work together with the tribal communities. And so here we have just a very short list of the various accomplishments that we have accomplished here with the Nevada Indian Commission. And so one of our big ones is we have a tribal legislative forum, and we hold that the January before every, every legislative session. And so during this forum, we invite all the tribal leaders and tribal representatives to come to the Capitol, and we invite the, the assembly men and women, as well as the senators, to come and, and speak with the various um, tribal leaders and representatives and then we also go over the, the very lengthy process of, of what it takes to get a bill passed. Um, even working with the state, it's still, for, for myself, it's difficult to understand all the different steps and layers and different meetings and everything that, that, have, that goes into having a bill passed. So we're able to, to, to educate the tribal leaders on what it takes to, to, get, that bill, to, get, to get a bill passed if they have anything in legislation. And then we also have our Nevada Tribes Legislative Day which is held the second Tuesday of, of session. And so again, we invite all the tribal leaders and tribal representatives um, to the legislature, and they're able to, to talk with their representatives and, and hold various meetings, and then we also um, have them you know, go before the different sessions and go to the different committee members or committees um, to really learn more about the process and to talk with, talk with their leaders um, at the state level. And then um, just some other, other ones. One of our big ones, another big event we have is our Stuart Father's Day powwow. And that's held every June. And so during, so all of the funds raised for, or during the powwow, all of that money goes towards the preservation of the Stuart Indian School. And so my next couple slides are gonna be just a very, very, very brief introduction um, about the Stuart Indian School here in Nevada. So I'm not sure if everyone is aware of the history of boarding schools, not only here in the state of Nevada with the Stewart Indian School, but the boarding school history um, in, in the whole United States, as well as um, up in Canada. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, it's a very tragic and very dark part of the history of Native Americans here in this country, in the state, and also in this world. Um, in, 19, in 1892, um, Captain Richard Pratt um, gave a speech in regards to what the Indian boarding school purpose was. So his definition was to kill the Indian and save the man. So essentially what that means is children, you know, little, little guys, little guys and girls um, up to teenagers, they were sometimes kidnapped. Um, from their from their homes, they were taken sometimes with with force and violence. Um, in in the later part of the boarding school, a lot some of the kids went went by choice. But in the earlier earlier parts of the um, boarding school history, um, it was just a very violent violent process and very traumatic process for for our people. That a lot of our people are still suffering through and still trying to cope with to this day of being stripped away from your home, taken away from your family, family and friends, taken away from your home, from your community, taken away from your land, taken, taken away um, from any familiarity that you, that you may have, your, your, your dances, your, your regalia, your songs, your ceremonies, all of that just stripped away. And that's essentially what kill the Indian and save the man meant. It was assimilation of, of the Native American children into quote unquote civilized society. So they're stripped of their language, stripped of their clothing, and you know they're forced to you know learn English. And a lot of times, um, a lot of that came through with with force and violence. And some of the darker parts of the boarding schools, there was a lot of you know sexual abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse of of these children to assimilate them to this quote unquote civilized society. So we have that here. We have that history here. In Nevada for our Nevada tribes and um, the Stuart Indian School was founded in 1890 
and remained operational until 1980. And I found this article in the Nevada Appeal, and our former executive director, Sherry Rupert, um, gave this quote that I think really sums up what, what Stuart meant to, to our people here. And she quoted, this school was meant to assimilate our Indian children, take away their language, take away their culture, essentially choose a different, different identity. And so again, I think this quote really sums up what Stuart Indian School means and, and meant to, to our people. And so the next couple slides are going to be about the legislative history of the Stuart Indian School here in Nevada. And so in the 78th session in 2015, the um, SB 63 was passed, which was the creation of the Nevada Indian Commission's gift fund, and also designated the Nevada Indian Commission as, um, as the coordinating agency for anything having to do with the building and grounds of the Stuart Indian <coughs> Campus. And then as well as AB 15, which was the creation of the account for the protection and rehabilitation of the Stuart Indian School. And then in the 79th session, in 2017, um, the legislature allocated $4.5 million to renovate the administration building into a cultural center and museum slash welcome center on the Stuart, Stuart campus, as well as an additional $1.2 million to renovate the roof of the old Stuart gym. And then in this past legis legislative session, um, the Nevada Indian Commission worked to get AB 44 passed, and this was a, a very big deal for the commission as well as for the Stuart Indian School because this actually put the Stuart Indian School Cultural Center Museum into statute already to or through the executive director to appoint a museum director and staff to actually get the museum up and running and so right now we're in our final phases of construction and so hopefully by the end of the year we'll have a um, <laughs> the Cultural Center Museum open as well as all the all of, as well as all of the exhibits installed, and I just wanted to acknowledge the the hard work that the commission staff um, have put into getting this this museum and cultural center up and running. They worked hand in hand with a lot of our alumni. They went out into the different tribal communities and talked with the elders, talked with the alumni to really to really get their side of the story and to be able to tell an accurate side of the story, the good, the bad, the ugly. And, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so, and, and we also work, so through, through the Nevada Indian Commission, we have a Stuart Advisory Committee, and that's comprised of alumni um, of the Stuart Indian School. And so the commission, we work hand in hand, anything having to deal with, um, well, really, really anything having to do with the Stuart Indian School, we, we consult with them, we get their input, we make sure that we're telling the most accurate story. And um, another quote from, from former executive Sherry Rupert um, that, again, that I think just really sums up the importance of this cultural center and museum. And so Sherry Rupert said, it's a sad, it's a sad part of our history that not a lot of people know about. But through this cultural center and museum, and then further development of the buildings, we are going to be able to tell that story for the world to know about. And the Stuart Indian School is a very important story to tell. And just from my own personal standpoint, both my father and, and mother, or not mother, but my aunt, um, attended the Stuart Indian School. So I have that personal connection to, to the school, and I am extremely honored and, and privileged to be a part of the Nevada Indian Commission and helping to, to preserve the Story Indian School and as well as to get the story out because this is a very important story to tell. And as uncomfortable as, as it may be to talk about this, it's a very important story. And um, even in talking with the alumni, a lot of, a lot of times they, they have funny, silly stories and they have a lot of good memories of Stuart and there were a lot of good things that came out of Stuart. Um, um, as as Stacy had mentioned, you know we have athletics, you know boxing and basketball. That was that was a big deal that came out of Stewart, as well as they had um, a very a, a very good um, good band, um, and then a lot of the the skills that were taught were a lot more vocational schools. So a lot of those students were able to actually go out into the world and utilize those tools. 
So, you know, with the Stuart Indian School, we do have the tragic part, the, the dark part, you know, with, with the sexual abuse, the mental abuse, the physical abuse, the stripping away of, of our children's identity. We also have the good parts, and a lot of the alumni that you, that you talk to, or that I've talked to, they do have a lot of good experiences that, that came out of Stuart, and a lot of times they, they don't want to talk about the bad things. So that's that cultural trauma that we're trying to deal with. Even my own father and aunt, when I try to ask them stuff about Stuart or, or things that happen, they'll, they'll laugh or they'll tell a silly story. I mean, my dad always laughs about when they would always run away. And so I asked him, well, why do you guys, why did you run away? And he just said, well, we just, we just did. You know, there's no like context behind it or what was really going on. So it's the story Indian school, the preservation of it, the story that, that we're trying to tell with it is an important part of, of the history of not only of, of my people, but for the state of Nevada and for you know, the rest of the country. And so my final slide is just some additional information that we have. We have a Nevada Indian Commission website, as well if you want to learn more about the Stewart Indian School, there is a website for that. And then um, I will turn it over to my colleague Marla, who's going to talk a little bit more about the legislative um, things that went down this session. Thank you. Good evening, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, before I get started into my formal presentation, I just wanted to follow up on something that, uh, a couple of things that Brian said, um, and acknowledge that um, probably of all the speakers up here, I'm the one who will not be talking any of my language. Um, I grew up in a household where we just didn't talk it. Um, and when, when I was growing up, if I was around an elder, they teased me because they knew I didn't understand the language. Um, so, you know, in that teasing, you kind of you get a little bit resentful, I guess, um, you know, and, and what, for whatever reason, um, I don't speak my language, I don't understand my language. Um, I'm Shoshone, we don't identify as the Paiutes do with the different types of um, Dakota at the end of, of their language. We've always considered ourselves Nua, and um, we're just the Western Shoshone, and, and we're the Nua people, and Nua in our language means simply we're the people, which um, it, it rel means relatively the same for all, all the other tribes as well. We, we all just consider ourselves the people, and um, it's, it's kind of how we move things forward. When it comes to Stuart, uh, you know, um, I also, I, th I don't think that there's a Native American in, the, in Nevada who grew up on a reservation who doesn't have or know someone who has a story of, about Stuart. Uh, my, I grew up on the South Fork Indian Reservation in um, northeastern Nevada, at the base of the Ruby Mountains. It's a beautiful place. They had a one-room schoolhouse. Uh, my parents went to eighth grade, and if and if they couldn't live in Elko beyond eighth grade, they didn't go to high school. So my mom ended up living in Elko. My dad chose not to go to high school. My dad went to work as a, you know, as soon as he got out of eighth grade and, and has ranched um, most of his life. But at one point, my mom ended up going to Stewart, um, and she says, I don't know why I was there, um, she, but she was there with a friend, and the friend ran away, and my mom ran away, and they never went back. Um, and my experience, though, the school closed in 1980. I graduated high school in 1982. I can remember starting high school, and there would be kids, native kids, you know, in my class, and then one day they'd be gone. And it's like, well, where'd they go? Well, they got sent to Stewart. So at that point, it was almost like a reform school for kids. It wasn't, you know, I'm going to go to Stewart, and I'm really excited about going to Stewart and going to this high school. It was. We're getting you out of town because you're getting into too much trouble, um, or you know, whatever whatever was going on. So um, that was my experience. Um, my experience growing up, and you know, we aren't even touching on so many of the other contemporary issues that uh, Native communities face um, in, in in this country today. But um, one of those was I lived in constant fear that I was going to be taken away from my family. I had a brother; he's two years younger than me. And I was always worried if my parents were going to mess something up and I was going to be pulled out and put in foster care. Um, those were real issues that, that we faced as kids growing up. So you talk about cultural trauma, you know, trauma that starts at, at Stewart, that
continues um, all throughout your life because you never know what's going to happen um, to your family because of how the larger society views your values and traditions and um, how they don't really value who we are as people and how we grew up with each other as Stacy opened with. You know, we knew what we were doing. We were, we were following the game. We were, you know, doing things that we knew what to do and, and the larger society judged that as being um, primitive. And, and so we continue to deal with those issues today. And so I am actually privileged to work in the field that I work in today, <coughs> which is lobbying. My, my first slide, if I can work this, I put 28 tribes in Nevada, so somehow I added a tribe. Um, <coughs> but um, of, those, of the 27 tribes in Nevada, you only have two of them that have formal rep representation <coughs> during a legislative session. The Reno Sparks Indian Colony is bolded because that's who we represent. We're proud to represent the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. I tell you, it has been um, one of my um, professional, one of the things I'm most proud of, proud of professionally is to be able to do that work before the Nevada legislature. The Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe also um, retains a, a lobbyist. And then once tribal cannabis came into effect in 2017, I believe, um, we then took on the Las Vegas Paiute Tribe and the Fort McDermott Tribe. Um, the Arrington Paiute Tribe and the Walker River Paiute Tribe are also pretty politically active, but they're not represented by, by, by formal firms. <clears throat> I went too far. <laughs> How come I'm the only one having trouble with this? I want to just go briefly through some of the legislation. The 2019 legislative session was a banner year for tribes before the Nevada legislature. Um, bills were introduced that weren't even asked for by tribes. Bills were amended that um, legislators just took it on themselves because they recognized the importance of being able to extend certain um, provisions to tribes in Nevada. Um, but one of the first bills um, was Assembly Bill 134, extends the privilege of confidential communications. Um, it was a sp sponsored by a first-term Assemblywoman, Shea Backus. Uh, she does work with tribal communities and her work as an attorney, and so this is something that she recognized tribes could benefit of, of having the same um, extensions of privilege conversations um, in, their, in their work with victims. AB 137, sponsored by Assemblyman Howard Watts, also a first-term Assemblyman. This um, built on legislation from 2017 that allowed tribes to have polling locations for voting. And um, what it did was say once a tribe established a polling location, they don't have to go back and ask for permission to have that polling location out into the future. So all of the tribes that have polling locations Reno Sparks Indian Colony, Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, Walker River Tribe, they get to have those locations and they don't have to ask for permission to do it again. Assembly Bill 264 was the biggest bill, in my, in my opinion, during the session, and it established a consultation process for state agencies. The Nevada Indian Commission, Stacy, <laughs> Stacy gets to take on this challenge of developing a draft policy for agencies, state agencies, to connect with Nevada tribes on issues that affect the tribes. It was sponsored by first-term Assemblywoman Sarah Peters. Um, Assemblywoman Peters actually has a standing working relationship with a Yarrington Paiute tribe. And so one of the things that prompted her to do this is uh, Nevada established a new state park in the last couple of years. And that was done without talking to the Yarrington Paiute tribe at all. And that state park actually is right around um, their indigenous area. And it caused a lot of resentment by the tribe that this whole thing was going forward and they didn't even know about it um, until it happened. And so one of the things that a consultation policy will do, we hope, is to head off those, those kinds of um, actions. Um, we want state agencies, once they start, embark on any um, program or activity, to say, hey, how are the tribes going to be affected by this? And who do I work with? to be able to figure this out. And if they don't know, they can call Stacy. And, and, and um, that is one of the roles of the Indian Commission is to help agencies figure out who can be instrumental in moving things forward. 
Senate Bill 82, 182 allows tribal officers to enforce state law off of the reservation. Senate Bill 366 established the practice of dental therapists as a complement to dentists and dental hygienists. Now, this bill will only apply in underserved areas, but it also applies to tribal communities sponsored by Senator Julia Ratty. And um, uh, she worked with the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe on this legislation. And then a number of bills formalized a relationship between the Division of Emergency Management and Nevada Tribes as it relates to emergency response. And these were actually done by the Division of Emergency Management. And so we're always grateful and thankful to agencies that do work on behalf of tribes without being prompted to do it, without having taken criticism to do it. And so we're very thankful for them um, recognizing that. Um, bills that got amendments um, because people were aware of um, how tribes could be benefited by adding amendments one of those was AB 152. This actually started out as a bill to protect fossils in Southern Nevada. And unfortunately, because native remains are still considered um, property, if you will, they're dealt with in the Nevada Revised Statutes that way. Um, so what we were able to do, at least in this respect, where it relates to native remains, is to enhance penalties that would be equivalent to if you're destroyed a fossil, you know, and destroying native remains would be equivalent to that. I can tell you that I don't believe that that's satisfactory um, for us to, to treat those remains that way. Um, they shouldn't be considered fossils and they shouldn't be in a chapter that, that treats native remains as fossils. Um, but we did get an amendment to at least equalize those penalties um, and we did that on behalf of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. AB 393 was sponsored by Speaker Frierson and it was intended to extend to entities that, um, or employees in the state who were affected by a federal government shutdown. Um, and then uh, Assemblywoman Peters got an amendment on this bill to also, also extend it to tribal employees. And it gives them protection for mortgage, you know, you're not going to lose your home if you can't pay your bill uh, to your vehicles, you know, your loans on your vehicles. Um, it also, I think, provides energy assistance. Um, but things that we don't think about, and, and so again, um, having people out there who recognize that tribes can benefit from that, some of this stuff has just been um, so beneficial. ACR4 was a study of wildfires, and at the end of the legislative session, a tribal representative was added as a member of this study on wildfires. That's unique as well, and Assemblywoman Heidi Swing did that. And then AJR2, which urged Congress to reject the U.S. Air Force expansion in Southern Nevada, um, got the Moapa Band of Paiutes added as a party to the resolution. So I think what my message is, is that representation matters. Uh, amended bills showing, uh, show that representation matters. Having full-time lobbyists and a presence with legislators brings awareness and opportunity for them to support tribes with legislation. Senator Ratty and Assemblywoman Peters recognized opportunities in bills um, to, for entities to consult with tribes, and they did that without being prompted. Assemblyman Watts brings his own values to the table as a result of his background, and, and those values include supporting tribes. And finally, Assemblywoman Swank and Cohen were also instrumental in bringing a tribal voice. There are, like I said, a number of um, other <laughs> policy issues that um, we're not dealing with here today, but water policy is a big deal for tribes in rural Nevada. Tax policy is a big deal for tri tribes like the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, the Las Vegas Paiute Tribe, the Washoe Tribe, where they have Pyramid Lake Tribe, where they have business enterprises, even the Elko Band Council, some of the tribes in northeastern Nevada, um, where uh, they have businesses, they want to retain the revenue from those taxes for their own operations, and so that's something that we have to constantly watch and make sure that, um, that those rights don't get eroded by the state. Cannabis issues are new. Um, the Cannabis Control Task Force, early on in the legislative task. session, Chairman Arlen Melendez, who's here in the audience, actually said as a member of that group. Um, environmental issues, we have, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ms. Fillmore here to talk about environmental issues, but um, you know they're just they're so complex, and you know when you have the 
the interplay between federal government and state government and tribal government. Um, these issues, just, you just can't talk about them in, in one forum. Cultural resources protection is an area that we continue to focus our resources on um, in ter terms of lobbying. It started with a, a Senate Bill 244 from the 2017 legislative session. There, that's a typo, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, our work is done all with an eye toward protecting the sovereignty of tribes, which Stacy talked about earlier. Um, I just wanted to touch briefly on these bill draft requests. These are um, bills that didn't get introduced as legislation, but they show that there are people out there thinking about how they can benefit tribes. Um, this resolution that would have urged Congress to require the U.S. Board on Geographic Names to rename the, J J the Jeff Davis Peak with the more in appropriate tribal related name, it didn't move forward. It's because it didn't need to. Those efforts had gotten started and that action happened and, and that, that peak was actually renamed and I don't even know what the name is. I should have written that down. But um, So it, it didn't have to happen, but it was just nice that somebody recognized it. And then there was another bill um, on tribal affairs that I believe would have also been tribal consultation. Um, we deal with, on behalf of tribes, budgetary issues. I'm not going to go through that too much. Um, we also deal with regulatory issues. Um, so we have to monitor what goes on at a regulatory level in the departments. We work on behalf of our tribes to get clarification on implementation of statutes and regulations. Um, so the Department of Taxation, Department of Museums and History right now is undergoing a uh, regulations development process. As a result of Senate Bill 244, um, the legislation, again, was enacted in 2017. It's 2019. Um, we are still in the draft phase of those regulations. It is what it is, um, but we're continuing to work through, through that. And it has been a learning process for museum staff. It's been a learning process for us as well. And just learning how to communicate with each other and convey what our needs are. Um, so, um, you know, we're We'll just continue to work through that, and um, at some point when it comes to the adoption phase and actually moving to these to approval from the Legislative Commission, um, you know, if needed, that's where we would need help and advocacy. I don't think we're going to need it at this point. Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and we do have a Deputy Director here in the audience, um, Dominic Echegoyen, um, comes from this agency. Our issue there deals with the State Office of Historic Preservation and how it manages tribal cultural resources. So this is very important to us, something we want to um, get a lot more work done um, and hopefully we'll be able to do that out in the future. And then of course federal agencies, um, they currently recover cultural items as well and tribes are not able to get back those cultural items and so we actually have someone else in the audience, Eric Jimenez, who hopefully with the treasurer's office, we're going to be working with later. The legislation that was enacted under Senate Bill 244 allows tribes to act as repositories, and so we hope to be able to develop that so that tribes can actually get their resources back from the federal government. So I think I want to um, talk about cultural protection in terms of the legislation that was done in 2017 by Senator Ratty. A primary piece of that legislation was to require a permit to excavate a native burial site on private land. And it also removed a provision that was in state law that required testing on native remains. Um, the larger society would never require testing on a grave site. You would never go and dig up a grave site and say, hey, we're going to test this person and let's drill into their bones and let's, you know, do all these things. Well, for native remains, people didn't question it at all. And so it was actually enacted in law. So we were able to get that provision removed. The bill itself was very contentious. It took a long time to work it through the legislature. It was amended three times. The First Amendment removed references to historic items it removed a proposed enhancement of civil penalties for violating the provisions added by the bill. 
and it added language specifying that a permit wasn't required if standard activity was occurring, occurring relating to ranching, mining, construction, and similar activities. We actually consented to that last portion. Um, the others were done to allow us to continue to move the bill forward. Um, because they, it was just going to be continue to be opposed by the state agencies that had affected unless we made those changes. The second amendment took out references to cultural items, except as they specifically applied to funerary objects. And then the third amendment added certain exceptions if an agreement existed already. And some of the um, some of the mines in Nevada have gone forward and negotiated separate agreements with tribes, and so that provision there allows those agreements to kind of supersede state law. I'm on the fence about that right now, but we'll see how that works out. Um, again, the major challenge that we had going through this process was working with the state agencies. Private industry worked with us um, on that language that I talked about, mining and ranching. However, when we moved into the implementation phase, we found that it was um, determined that the language that said, hey, you don't need a separate permit if you're mining, or if you're ranching, uh, somehow it, it got turned around and now if you're ranching and you know that there's a native gravesite on your private land, you can excavate that without having to get a permit, which violates the whole premise of the, of the legislation that we had enacted. So. That's an area that we need to go back to the 2021 legislative session and fix, and we could definitely use help in getting that change done. I don't think we'll have any um, problems with private industry. It's just a matter of how we can um, work it through the legislature. But, you know, I think one of the reasons we're here today and one of the reasons we consent to this is because we want to help with dialogue. We want to open up dialogue. We want people to kind of understand where we're at um, in today's society that it's not okay to treat native human, native remains, it's not okay to treat um, all of our cultural sites as something that is, is just meant to be studied. Um, they're important to us. We, we were all throughout this land. We touched every portion of, of these states and it's not okay to, for us just to be dismissed and, and our emotional ties to the items that we left behind to be dismissed as, well, you know, it's time for y'all to move on. It's just not okay. So we need to break down the resistance to returning items to tribes. Um, and we need to overcome that lack of recognition that these items, um, that they didn't belong to people. I don't think people recognize that items, you know, we're, we're people. We've been people since um, day one, and we're just not treated that way. And so we're really looking for dialogue to change, um, for people to quit seeing um, items they come across out there on the land as belong to, belonging to government, um, because they don't belong to government, they, they belong to the tribal people that um, left them behind. So, you know, when we learn, when it comes to statutory language, words matter, how we convey ideas matters, We'll continue to work on issues and hope that um, tribes become a priority and that we're not treated as just archeological resources to be studied, um, that government agencies do work, um, let go of their deeply held beliefs that tribes should not get their items back, and that government agencies give deference to tribes and their voices, and that they don't take it on themselves to speak for tribes. That's all I have. And then I will turn it over to Helen Fillmore who will enlighten us about environmental issues. Me angawa mibi'i de wa la ume de gumbia le'i, paolu de de'i le'i, wa wa shu de shimu ke'i, wa ringu e ebe'i, wa di bugayai'i ashmi le'o gadamu baga. Um, everybody, I'd just like to welcome you here and thank you for having me. Um, my name is Helen Fillmore and I'm part of the Washu tribe of Nevada and California. I uh, currently sit on our tribal council, so our governing body that they were referring to as uh, uh, the legislative body. I was elected last October. Um, 
and I represent our off-reservation tribal members. So um, I provided a, okay, let me see, there we go. Um, so I provided a map of what our traditional territories are, and right at the middle, um, we have Da'al Aga'a, um, and then I also have kind of our main rivers that our uh, people depended on, and uh, the Truckee River and the Karsten River. Um, I am going to be talking a little bit about environmental issues, but I really want to focus more on um, moving forward and how some of our give examples of how our community is trying to move forward in the face of change. Um, and when we consider that, I guess when we're thinking about that, we got to think about uh, where we came from and um, where we're going. Um, so the title of my presentation today is Gabagi, which means the future. Um, and in our culture and a lot of indigenous cultures, when we're talking about the future, um, we're not only referring to five years ahead, ten years ahead. Um, we're not even just thinking within our own lifetime, but we're thinking about the future as all future generations. And so what are we doing, what kind of work are we doing within our lifetime to provide for all future generations? Um, and so if we're doing that work responsibly, then we should be asking, how is the work that we're doing today providing for the, um, allowing our future generations to thrive in this area that we're at? And I think this is a, a viewpoint that is, um, a lot of times I, I imagine it's very unique to indigenous communities considering a lot of the major threats that our society is facing with climate change, um, with a, a, a kind of limited economic opportunities for young people, high student loan debt. Um, young people in the United States are under an unbelievable amount of stress when they start to consider the future. Um, the indigenous perspective, I think with us and with our Washington perspective, we, we offer, um, we try to offer our people a little bit more hope because that's what our communities did in the past for us. Um, so I would say, uh, unlike a, a, a lot of communities here where we were, our, our culture was uh, in a lot of ways devastated by colonization, our language, uh, the loss of our language was significant. At the same time, we always had community members that were willing to work with others to document our language, to document um, our uh, environmental, um, I guess, to document the resources and their uses. And it was a, a way that even though they weren't able to kind of teach their kids because their kids were off at Stewart Indian Boarding School, um, they were able to hold that space for somebody to pick it up later. And so a lot of our work is building off of this work that's been done before. And we're just trying to find out how do we make it go a lot further and how do we do it in a way that we're protecting our environmental resource for all people, not just our own communities. Um, and so these, I'm sharing a lot of pictures of some of the, the youth in our communities, my little nieces and nephews, cousins, um, friends, because to me, this is what this work's all about. This is about them, this is about their great, great, great grandkids. And so mentioned earlier, I'm a, um, I just wanted to kind of give a brief background on when I got more into climate science work. Um, four years ago, I started my master's program at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I was hired on to this project, the Native Waters on Arid Lands Project. And this ultimate goal of this project was to enhance the climate resiliency of water resources on reservation lands. Um, and four years ago when we were having this, when we were starting our conversations about this project, it was really a conversation about vulnerability. Indigenous communities are the most vulnerable to climate change. Um, and this is because our, our language and our culture is directly linked to our environmental resources. Um, the Paiute people, when they introduce themselves, the agai fish, the cutthroat trout, that was once so abundant in their lake that they their identity is completely linked to that. It doesn't exist there anymore. And so when you think about these cultural losses due to climate change, to environmental devastation, um, our communities are really vulnerable. We're, 
We've lost so much due to contamination and due to rising temperatures, due to misuse of our natural resources. And so moving forward, how do we re regain that? How do we, we make things better and how do we work with others to do that is kind of the, the ultimate question. Um, so now I'm going to scale back down a little bit with the Native Waters on Arid Lands project. It's a huge project focused on the Great Basin and the southwestern United States. But this project, um, I'm really lucky to be a part of a community who um, values and prioritizes climate adaptation initiatives. And so uh, the Washington people and our Environmental Protection Department has been conducting environmental adaptation planning efforts for I think the last, it might be the last four years as well, um, trying to solicit community input in that, um, trying to do their best to identify the opportunities to help our communities move forward in the face of catastrophic wildfires, in the face of higher uh, rates of flooding, in the face of um, lower air quality. And so they've got a lot of different things going on with that project. Um, and it's, it is really exciting to see what's going on, or what they've been able to, uh, what's been coming from that. And they're not done yet, but right now, today, yesterday, today, tomorrow, um, they've been hosting a climate adaptation symposium up in Tahoe, the center of our homelands, where they invited people from all over the, the nation, indigenous people, to learn from each other and try try to figure out lessons and barriers and opportunities that they can take back home to them to increase a lot of these efforts um, in climate adaptation and moving forward. Um, something that I think with our community that has been particularly, in a lot of ways, really unique, but also really advantageous, um, I guess some of our most proud projects that our communities are the most proud of is when we're able to partner with other governments, so local governments, state governments, other tribal governments, um, to really enhance all of our capacity to meet a shared goal. And so I've put up two pictures. Um, it 20 years ago, our tribe was able to uh, get a special use permit for the Meeks Bay Resort up in Tahoe. And so this is for service land, but our tribe was able to get this special use permit. And so it was getting our lands back into our hands, um, at least for the management of that area. Um, and we've been running that, tribal members have been running that resort for the last 20 years, um, hoping to keep that work going in the future. Um, and then as part of that, right across the street from the resort is a Meeks Meadow. And um, also around 20 years ago, the Forest Service and the tribe were really trying to work in ways to, I guess, build that capacity and how do we work in partnerships to restore our natural resources, restore our ecosystems to better conditions. Um, it took 20 years, but finally this summer our tribal council signed a stewardship agreement with the Forest Service, which gives us a, a lot of agency over the management of the thinning projects to help restore that, that meadow into a, a healthy meadow ecosystem. And uh, our Environmental Protection Department, again, they'll be administering those programs, hopefully within the next year and or two years. Uh, with some of environmental projects, it's weather dependent. So this year we had a really wet year and people couldn't even really access the site until later in the summer. Um, next year, we're always praying for water and precipitation for snow, but at the same time, we are hoping that we'll be able to conduct that work uh, in a, a effective way. Um, this was part of a project that I got to be, so this is also kind of I think it ultimately came out of those partnerships in Meeks Meadow, but um, I was part of a, a Native American research assistantship with the Forest Service and the Wildlife Society this summer, and the goal of our project was to look at, to I guess to research and understand how to restore culturally important plants in the face of climate change within these meadows, and we had three different meadows, Baldwin Meadow, Meeks Meadow and Page Meadows up in the Tahoe Basin that we were looking at. And um, we did both field studies, so vegetation assessments, and then we also worked with Washu elders and community members 
um, and again revisited those resources um, that were left by our, our my some of the I guess documents were even interviews with my great great grandmother um, and so we got to revisit some of these interviews and work that was done back in the 1950s um, 1970s and then the 1990s and early 2000s and so uh, revisiting that work becomes kind of a, a not only an environmental restoration ecological restoration but a restoration of our people on the landscape and then a restoration of our cultural practices in that area um, Right here, I just want to share a quick story. So this is uh, Kara James and her mother, Lita Wyatt James. And this is uh, Lorraine Keller. Um, she's also on our tribal council. And then her mother, uh, Ramona. And um, when it comes to our plant knowledge in our Washington communities, that knowledge was traditionally mostly held by the women. And so anytime we get multiple generations of Washu women on the landscape conducting work, our whole communities become so much stronger. And that's the best way to bring, that was the way that this information was handed down for thousands and thousands of years, and this is the way that the information is going to continue to be passed on for future generations. And so to me, it's almost hard not to get emotional every time I look at these photographs because of how special this moment was to see this um, happening again in this landscape. Um. Oh, it's not going. Okay. Um, another, I guess, uh, project that our communities have been working on to um, try to provide for the future are community gardens. And um, this is this is my dad and Marsha Litzinger and. I don't know if you guys know the lit singers, but a lot of people know the lit singers, and they are these incredible organic farmers um, from, I think, Silver Springs, just right over the hill here. And um, my dad was really concerned because a lot of our community members suffer from um, physical ailments, diabetes, obesity, things, things of that nature at really high rates, and. Um, He's always been really healthy. He's very athletic. Uh, he loves to run. He lo still loves to play basketball. Um, it's hard to, 60 years old, and he's running with 27-year-olds, and it's scary sometimes as his daughter. I want to put a towel over my head, but um, he still hangs in there. Um, and one of the things he wanted to do was to start a community garden to grow fresh vegetables for our elder center and for our preschool, our Head Start. Um, to help provide fresh organic greens that were grown from our community members on our lands. And this was really interesting, a really cool project because we do have um, a ranch. We do own a ranch, a couple of ranches, I guess, the Stewart Ranch, and then we also own a ranch. The tribe owns a ranch in Dresslerville. Um, and this is commercial agriculture. We grow alfalfa and um, have cattle, typically. Um, and so to kind of gain a plot that was really just for food, that wasn't an economic endeavor um, to help feed up community members, it was really special this last year. Uh, they were really able, and every summer, in the summertime everyone's looking for things to get the kids to do, so every summer they would have the kids come out and, and weed and pick whatever you know was ready, summer squash, things like that. Um, and then this year was the first year they did uh, seedling planting with young people, and so they had our babies, you know, our seeds were planting our actual seeds and then they transplanted them into the garden. And so it's a way to um, include multiple generations to have agency and uh, input over their health and say um, into the future. And I put this in here, revitalizing Washi language and cultural practices. Um, because it really is central to all of our efforts. Uh, across the board with the Washu tribe, we really try to um, include our community members and include, integrate the best we can our language and culture into to our efforts. Um, because, and the importance of this, our people are one of the oldest people, our culture is one of the oldest cultures uh, in the Great Basin and even in California in the Sierras. 
Um, we are a language isolate, so our language is different than anybody else, is different from everybody that surrounds us. We are very we have a unique language, um, so it's a, a very unique culture direct, that came from a very unique line, landscape. And we look at Tahoe at the center of our homelands, and there's no other place like it on Earth. Um, there are similar places, but but not not the same. It's really a unique um, a unique place, and we're, we are. Uh, I guess um, proud to come from where we come from um, and so if we have tens of thousands of years where this culture and language has gotten us to be able to survive this far you know 15 feet of snow but we had moccasins and these little cute round snowshoes um, and we were able to get through every single winter and then in the summertime we're still hitting 100 degrees and uh, limited water resources um, and still able to thrive for those many years. And so by incorporating our language and our culture into everything we do, we really are providing for the future. We really are ensuring that those lessons are going to be carried on tens of thousand years from now. And so whereas I think it's, um, and I do this a lot uh, as a young person, feeling kind of the anxiety of the future that we're heading, we do have a lot of tools and resources left from people before us to help move us forward in a better way. Um, and in this picture, this was a workshop that we hosted in, in Meeks, at the Meeks Resort uh, with WashU youth. Um, they were camping out there. And it was plant identification. We taught them the WashU words for these plants. Um, the washu uses for these plants, but then also kind of um, the habitats that they usually grow in, because we wanted to put more of a science, um, integrate kind of the si current science that we know about these plants too within that workshop. And then we had them all uh, draw the plants, and they all came up with really creative ideas on how they, uh, I guess, used principles of plant identification in their drawings. So some of the plants were, drawings were a little bit more abstract, but they, um, made sure to have, you know, two pine needles, which is how you identify the lodgepole pine, rather than three pine needles in their drawings, which is how you identify the ponderosa pine. Um, and this right here, I'm just so proud of all these ladies, but these were the ladies that ran in our, our Washu Princess competition. And it's not, it, it's a pageant, but it's not, you know, a beauty pageant or something like that. It's a a pageant that's based in our language and our culture. And so all of these ladies, they'll introduce themselves in the language, they provide a talent, but it's a cultural practice that they show. And then all of them are in our contemporary traditional style of washu dance, so it, our washu dresses. And so um, I say contemporary because we didn't obviously have cotton, um, didn't make our dresses out of cotton historically. Um, but that this has kind of been the style for uh, over 100 years. Okay, and so now I'm gonna change direction because I, I was given a, a list of predetermined topics that I was allowed to talk about and none of what I just said was a part of that list. <laughs> um, but this, was a part of that list, so I'm going to talk about one topic that I promised to talk about um, today. And so I need a little bit of participation, um, even if it might be uncomfortable, but I do um, need just a little bit of participation. So I'm thinking of a place that's in south of Truckee, along the Truckee River, um, almost to Tahoe, and I'm, I, um, Hoping that you all can tell me what that place is called, and I'll give you a hint. Okay. Okay. So all of you just made all of the indigenous women here really uncomfortable, and but that's okay because I forced you to do it. Um, but and I want to break it to you guys: you're actually not correct. So, a few years ago, the community, oh, I can't change it, okay, the community of what is now called Olympic Valley 
has been, I think it was 2014, about five years ago, has been trying to incorporate as a township. And when they were beginning these efforts, they wanted to get rid of this derogatory term to refer to indigenous women of the area because if they were gonna start this new township, um, they didn't wanna base it on something that's racist and derogatory. And so they changed it to Olympic Valley. So if you look up Olympic Valley, if you look up the address for Squaw Valley Resort, it'll give you an address, I think it's Squaw Valley Boulevard, but the town will be Olympic, I believe the town is still Olympic Valley, California. And so this is something that people don't know about, but there have been a lot of efforts nationally to remove racial and derogatory terms from place names. Um, so I just provided a couple of examples. Nevada and California are not making statewide efforts to do this, but there are um, small examples um, where people are trying to change certain names and are able to organize locally to get that done. But why do we still call it Squaw Valley? So, oh, so here's just a couple examples in Nevada. Um, my favorite, Squaw Tit Mountain. Um, it doesn't get any more derogatory than that. Um, but why do we, we still call it that because this sign is still up there, but this sign isn't talking about the area. This sign is talking about the resort, and you can't see it, it's hidden by snow, but the sign, it's a business that refuses to rebrand into something more appropriate. And when I say something, oops, something more appropriate, I just wanna say, if you look at the sign and you look at that term, there's nothing that is significant, there's nothing that is appropriate about using that term to describe anything on this sign. Um, so I decided to do a little Photoshop rebranding. Um, so it's something businesses aren't required to change place names even under law. So even if that law was brought on by the state of California, this business would still continue to fight it. It still makes indigenous women incredibly uncomfortable. Um, when they have to hear about their friends going skiing or when I tell people I'm from Reno and then they ask me if I go skiing and then they ask me if I ever go to Squaw and I have to kind of like take a deep breath and walk away. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, but I did want to provide um, a little bit more context. So why was it called that in the first place? Right? It was because there were Washu women in that valley for thousands of years prior to the significant 1960 Winter Olympics. And so when the settlers came, they saw Washu women in that valley. So when we're considering renaming some of these areas that might be derogatory, it might be good to go back to the original people whose land that was. Um, so a perfect example in our homelands, and this was in Alpine County, California again, um, was that the Squaw Ridge was renamed after a proposal from the Washoe tribe. And I can't take any credit for this. This was uh, really organized by our previous tribal council and tribal leaders from the Hungalelti community and some of our cultural resource advisors. And um, they chose to, chose to name it Hungalelti Ridge. And Hungalelti, we don't refer to ourselves either by what we eat. We refer to, there's names for certain areas that we identify our different, I guess, bands of Washu from, and Hungalelti is our southern band, and because this um, mountain, this ridge is located in their area, they wanted to name it Hungalelti Ridge. And so, um, can you guys say Hungalelti? Hungalelti. Okay, you guys, that was really good. I'm impressed, I'm impressed. Um, but some people are really uncomfortable with indigenous names because indigenous names the original names of these areas because they're hard to say, right? And some of the symbols, you, you might not know what the symbols mean. Um, but I wanted to provide one example of a word that nobody knows how to pronounce, but that millions of people are familiar with. It's a washi word, and it's da'al. And so the little question mark in the middle is like a stop in the back of your throat. But So let's all try that, da'al. Da 
and you're still looking at me really confused. As soon as I said millions of people are familiar with this, you guys' eyebrows kind of furrowed, and we're like, why am I not in the loop on this? And the reason is we didn't have a written language when this um, term came about. Washington didn't have a written language. The, real, the term people are familiar with is the mispronunciation of this word, which is Tahoe, but it is an indigenous Washington name. Um, and so I've already been doing this for hundreds of years, um, and so it's not something that's going to be, it's not something that's brand new and has to be controversial or has to be, um, you know, well, if it's a Washi name, how come it's not you know, a Basque name, because we've got a high rate of Basque immigrants in the 1800s in this area. Um, it's something that's been happening for a long time, and, and um, so going back to that language, Going back to using these ways, again, this is how we provide for future generations, too. And uh, in case you're wondering, we've got a lot more place names. And so I just provided a couple of them um, right here around uh, Dot Owl. Um, and this was, this is part of a much larger story, but we do have, uh, again, a lot of our, our even though some of these names aren't being used contemporarily, not even by Washu people, uh, we do have these re resources to help revitalize the use of these area uh, of the traditional names and the traditional um, original names, I should say. And so, um, with that, oh, if there's, I guess, are we going into question session? that question. Before we do, may I take time to invite some other experts up to the stage with us? Um, I can't see to save my yeah, life. It's <laughs> I know we have, there we go, thank you. So um, uh, probably the farthest traveled, we have Vice Principal Lynn Manning John. She is from Hawaii High School combined schools. Lynn's our education expert, so we asked her to be here in case there are education questions you might have. We also have with us um, Chairman Arlen Melendez from the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. He's closing in on 25 years. Uninterrupted service, the highest elected official for his tribe. And then Clifford's here, right? I can't see, I'm so sorry. So um, we have the director of the EPA for Intertribal Council of Nevada with us also. So we wanna ask them to come join us on stage and we'll address that water question. Clifford, do you want to take a pass at this? Vegas. We'll let, Helen will also probably have some feedback, but she uh, might want to. Do you want to go? Oh. Start off a party with the most contentious question you can have. <laughs> Um, hello, my name is Clifford Van Willis, and I am the Tribal State Environmental Liaison for the Intertribal Council of Nevada. I am a member of the Tumult Tribe of Western Shoshone, and uh, my people, the Wadadika from Ruby Valley, Nevada. And um, so, kind of answering your question, going right into it, is, is I call it first come, first serve. That's a rule in state Nevada. Basically, the state uh, owns water rights in Nevada, although tribes can get what's called treatment as a state to conduct water quality um, projects to ensure that their, drinking, that their water is good. Drinking water and uh, clean water also separated out to the Clean Water Act, the Clean Drinking Water Act. But uh, when it really comes down to it, uh, the state of Nevada is who basically owns the rights. It gets a little more complicated uh, as to how you can use your rights. Uh, identification of what water, there's something called Waters of the USA, which is being and then kind of Waters of the USA is kind of confusing, I don't like the title of that as it is. But uh, they're looking at regulatory changes, uh, the definition of what constitutes water, uh, that you'd have to have something navigable that goes on the water. So that's something that Dominique and I deal with up there. Dominique is from the Department of Natural Resources, uh, State of Nevada, and I work uh, hand in hand with him. But that's basically the answer to that. Um, it gets contentious. I think it's ridiculous, in my opinion, because uh, who was here first? <laughs> um, but 
and um, I hope that's okay answer. I can go on and on with an answer for that question. Though. Helen wanted to say anything. <clears throat> okay, my my question um, is, how is education uh, handled with the 27 tribes around the state? How is education? How is education handled with? Can I use my teacher voice? <laughs> Actually, um, I'm going to ask my friend and expert to use her teacher's voice. Um, again, Lynn Manning is the vice principal at Hawaii Combined Schools. Will you tackle that one? And please use the mic. How am I? I won't go into the full inter uh, introductions just to save you all some time. But my name is Lynn Manning John. I am the vice principal of the Hawaii Combined School. Um, I'm also an enrolled member of the Duck Valley Shoshone Paiute Tribe. Uh, in the state of Nevada, so traditionally, pre-contact, you know, it was that whole concept of it takes a village. So, and then we come into the boarding school era, uh, which removed children from their homes and families. Post boarding school and actually kind of like simultaneously with boarding schools within our state, um, there were day schools in some communities that uh, educated the students who remained on reservation. So those day schools were very much like a public school today, but uh, outside of Nevada there were a lot of uh, religious-based schools. So like if you were to go northern into like Montana, there's a lot of Catholic schools, Baptist schools. Um, but here in the state it was uh, mostly locally, uh, local people coming together to educate kids on just the basics. Over time, um, it branched out and it became the duty of counties. So now within the state of Nevada, um, there are several different types of schools. I work for the Elko County School District, um, and my particular school has the largest, the single largest enrollment of native students in our state. We have over 300 native students within our schools. However, the largest population is in fact in Clark County where there are over 1,200 Native students, although the majority of them are not from Nevada tribes, they're from all over. Um, so Clark County being the largest provider of educational services to Native students in our state, but in those schools, one Native kid in a thousand um, is about where those numbers are. We also have, as uh, Mr. Wadsworth mentioned, tribal schools. So we have, those are funded by the Bureau of Indian Education and are operated through a governing board made up of uh, local tribal people um, and then we also serve within our, our we have many kids who still go to boarding schools although the concept has changed a lot um, it is no longer kill the Indian save the man it's a lot of preserve the traditions because and as Miss McDade Williams mentioned the language was lost it was forced out of our ancestors so when we don't know why we speak the language it's actually not our fault it was beaten and forced out of our ancestors um, now, and as Ms. Fillmore alluded to, it's been preserved in records, in wax recordings, and when communities like mine have the luxury of being so isolated that we have many, many still fluent speakers, my mother being one of them, um, we can reintroduce those into um, common vernacular. So within schools, boarding schools, um, public schools, tribal schools, we're reintroducing tribal languages. I know that in the, Wash in the Clark County School District, um, they're attempting to introduce Southern Paiute into the schools that serve the Southern Paiute communities. Washoe County School District has Paiute language offered at Reed Spanish Springs High Schools, North Valley's. North Valley's High Schools. My school offers Shoshone language as part of the curriculum. Native languages are not foreign languages. They are the original languages. English is a foreign language that we've adapted and learned. Um, we hope to build bilingual communities where our languages become, at least, we can build them up so that we're fully bilingual. Uh, but the, to answer again directly your question, um, it is primarily, in the state of Nevada, primarily the Nevada Department of Ed and counties that handle that, except in instances where the tribe has taken that over. Um, as the primary responsibility, but even in Pyramid Lake, they share students, some of their students go to, 
to Pyramid Lake Junior Senior High School, it's a school of choice, but they all, may also go to Fernley High School in Lyon County, or some of them are bused into uh, Reno and attend school at, um, well, if they're in high school, they go to Reed, they can go to Mendive, they also go to Shaw, Spanish Springs, and I want to say we even have kids who come from Sutcliffe Community to Alice Taylor Elementary, so there's busing that happens also, and then Natchez, of course, on the, uh, in the town of Wadsworth, which is a Washoe County School District school. Carson City also has liaisons from the Washoe tribe, so they have, we have people in the, in the schools from the communities trying to, one, advocate for our students who exist in school but are often um, not seen. You know, you see, you see our skin and assume we're Hispanic, but Hispanics are native too. That's a misnomer to call them Hispanic because they are native people to this continent, um, just a little bit further south. Um, we're here, we, we're often dismissed or unseen, we blend in, so our tribal communities are often reaching out from their tribal spaces into schools to ensure that Native students are served, that our history is taught, not as histor history, but as contemporary stories, and that we are progressive, modern people with tribal communities that are vibrant, and modern and then we create people like everybody on this panel um, <laughs> who have all been through systems of Nevada. I think every single one of us is a product of some, some school system from within here in the state. So, I mean, we're doing good work with education. We have, still have terrible statistics, but we have wonderful children and the former executive director of the Nevada Indian Commission had mentioned, you know, we're only 1% of the population, probably less now with the growing population. But that 1% is 100% of us. We don't have another place to go and find more of us. I tell the kids from my community, and I did in a speech at Pyramid Lake, there are more giant pandas in the world than there are Pyramid Lake Paiutes. And we have so many efforts to revitalize pandas, and every time a panda is born, it's a celebration and a naming contest. <laughs> but there are more of them than there are of us, and we need to do the same with ourselves, and we need to teach our children that, that they're born a whole person, and to embrace them as a whole person, and to educate them as a whole person, and not kill their spirit in order for them to um, become educated and be successful um, in our modern era. We're very contemporary and modern, and we absolutely will continue to exist into the future with education on our backs. Success, I think what we try to do, whether it's economic development or, or anything, is creating partnerships, you know, with everybody. I think the success of my tribe has been, 
you know, with economic development, it's really uh, getting out and talking to people so that they know who we are, you know. I don't think a lot of people know uh, that there is a tribe in the center of Reno, Nevada. And so we had to get out and just meet people, talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And that's the same thing uh, in reverse. You, you know, just to get to know some of the tribal leadership or just anybody, just uh, talk to them. They're open for you to come and visit our reservation or we'll always make time for you to our tribal offices to just talk about any situation, you know. And, you know, uh, I, I think uh, over time, you know, uh, we've overcome a lot of racism in the, in the state of Nevada. They used to refer to Reno as a little Mississippi of the West. And so we had, to, even out here at a garden mill, they had to be off the streets by sundown. And it was the same in Reno. So we had a long, uh, and in, in fact, in uh, 2006, I was appointed to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights by uh, Senator Reid. So I served six years uh, in traveling to Washington, D.C. to addressing civil rights issues. So, you know, it's really breaking down those walls and, um, and really coming to know people and hearing their perspective as to, you know, where they're coming from on issues. And so we've come a long way, really, in educating people. And as they know who we are, then it, it tends to, and as we become more educated and reach out to people, I think it breaks down those walls and it lessens maybe, even though there will always be a certain amount of prejudice. And everybody's prejudiced, to tell you the truth. We're, we're, just, we're born that way. I think all of us, it's not just a one race is prejudiced. I think when you really think about it, we all can be a little bit uh, prejudicial. And so I think we have to overcome ourselves in a way. But uh, just uh, reaching out and talking to uh, people, uh, I think the Native Americans, one thing about them, they're really welcoming to people, no matter how they're treated. When you really think about it, when we look at today's, of all the people, you think about militancy, you know, you think that, gee, they, would, they should be the people planting bombs and all the things that are going on in all of these different countries, right? The, the way they've been treated, but you don't see that. You see them really, uh, forgiving, you see them really trying to still work with people. And that's just the nature of our people. And so when you start to do that, I think you hear uh, people start to really open up. And so, you know, there's so many issues out there that we can address, you know, and so it's gonna take all of us and really understanding one another and really uh, coming together and really talking about things, uh, reasoning together, you know, to find common ground and that's what uh, I've done for, I think I'm in my 28th year as a chairman at Reno Sparks, but going out and talking to people, wherever we have an impasse, we try to walk it through and try to create a win-win situation between other governments and ourselves. So but with that, I hope to kind of answer your question that we're pretty open for you to come and, and talk with us. So thank you. all the time who's not at the table who hasn't been we heard from yet um, so when this panel was being organized I, I believe this might be the first time that you guys had a session focused on indigenous issues yes yes so if somebody had asked the question um, who hasn't been here yet let's see if we can get them at the table and hear from them um, and then I think in the organization of this panel too they were trying to figure out who's not at the table um, and I, I got added on their little Washu uh, community, but it was still that same same effort of who's not at the table, how do we get them here, um, how do we make sure that their voice is also being heard. And so in all aspects of our life, in our communities, we're always asking that same thing. So in your daily work, in um, I guess whatever you do best, also look around and ask um, who you can hear from. Because I think one of the other issues that kind of add to erasure is I think sometimes people feel obligated to speak for other communities. Um, and I th think that that's really inappropriate. Um, and so it's not necessarily, it, it's not necessarily just providing our viewpoints or providing documentation, but it's also important to have those people there speaking for their own communities and speaking for themselves. So I just want to add that much more.
to and that you need um, Shoshone, Colony, and Duck Water. But my question isn't about that. I just wanted to get that on the table um, <laughs> out there. Um, I was wondering, I have a couple of questions actually. I was wondering um, for the implementation of the AB 264 consultation bill for state agencies, um, should they start consulting right away or do they have to wait until the policy is written by the uh, Nevada Indian Commission? Um, definitely start right away. I mean, they don't need, a, they don't need a policy to do that. I think um, the policy and the legislation resulted from inaction, but anybody who's willing to go out there right now and, and start initiating conversation is, is more than welcome to do that. And the hope is that nobody waits for this policy to do that. Um, the policy is just something to try to force the discussion. You know, the legislation is there to force the discussion, but hopefully that starts immediately. Um, yesterday. <laughs> I, I have another, another question. Um, I do a lot of travel in rural Nevada, and you know there's all those historical markers of what happened. They're all the shape of the state of Nevada. But it doesn't seem to me that there's very many that, um, that remark on um, native um, occurrences. Um, and things that happened and places that where things happened. A specific example is um, the Swamp Cedars in Spring Valley in White Pine County where there were multiple massacres and there's nothing that even recognizes or marks that and nobody knows that that um, um, horrific um, thing happened. And so I was just wondering if it's possible for the, I mean if anybody thinks that's a good idea to to start to have that sort of cultural education take place and how it would take place, or if you've thought of it, or I don't even know, it would probably be the Nevada Indian Commission. And then before you answer that, while I still have the microphone, I just want to say I think it would be great for Sierra, Sierra Nevada Forums to have a follow up forum, which brought some of the uh, Native activists who are working on some of the issues around the state. Um, you know, Rupert Steele perhaps with the water issue that we're involved in, something to do with the Yarrington tribe and what's going on with that. And you know, there's others as well. Just to sort of um, bring a follow-up forum that could really bring some of the key environmental issues and natural issues to life. Okay, so the historic markers is the question. <laughs> I think you're speaking to another lobbyist. Others may want to jump in, but I think where I would start is the State Office of Historic Preservation actually has the statutory responsibility to identify the, the resources, the historic and prehistoric resources in the state of Nevada. Um, you know, combined work with the you know, Division of Museums and History. Uh, so I think that they have the responsibility, um, and it's a matter of prioritizing what work gets done. There's a state plan, and Mr. H. going to probably talk about that way better than I can, but um, the state plan actually has to be adopted every 10 years, four years, I don't know what it is. There's, there, there's some periodicity to it where um, as you assess the state's resources, people should be putting input into saying, hey, we want to know about these other occurrences in the state of Nevada. So we don't want to know just physical locations of where petroglyphs are. Um, we want to know about some of the bigger issues that, that occurred in the state. And that's all part of that assessment through the state plan process, which um, is right now being redone. And uh, there's a draft. Um, that draft will be released in, by the end of this month for an open comment period. So I guess I would recommend that people get on that distribution list for that draft, for one, so that you can have input um, right now, there's no tribal specific tribal representation in the state plan. Um, it's something that is, actually has just been dis discussed kind of this week and maybe last week, but I mean, think we're going to be trying to move forward something in that respect. Um, ideally, it wouldn't be tribes coming to the outside into that plan. Ideally, the plan would recognize that, 
hey, there's a tribal resource that we want to talk about in this plan, and it wouldn't put the burden on tribes to impose themselves on the process. That's kind of where it's at right now. Um, it, but but that's, that's kind of where that's at. Anybody else wants to add? So on the Pyramid Lake Indian Reservation, we do have one of the, the state markers um, that actually more talks about the Pyramid Lake War Memorial, um, which happened in the 1800s. Um, that's when um, the Paiute people of, of Pyramid Lake, they fought at the U.S. Army, and they were successful. Um, but there were a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of casualties that happened during that, during that war. But we do have one of the historical markers, and I think um, to kind of reiterate, reiterate what Chairman Melendez said is that um, there has to be communication that goes on, not just you know from the state to the tribes, but also from the tribes to the state, the tribes to the public. Um, there are there's just a lot of communication that has to go on, and there are a lot of different moving parts. And as part of the Nevada Indian Commission, um, that's definitely one of our our goals is to be able to help and facilitate those conversations because trying to get 27 tribal governments to, to come to the table is is very difficult and is nearly impossible because you have a lot of tribes that are in in very rural areas and a lot of tribes don't have the resources um, especially you know funding they don't have that funding to you know come to come to Carson or even come you know really travel anywhere so it's really hard for a lot of those tribes to communicate, but I think, you know, on the Nevada Indian Commission, you know, it would behoove us to, you know, kind of be a catalyst, and there's also ITCN, the Intertribal Council of Nevada. Um, their board is comprised of, of the tribal chairmen and, and women of the tribes here in Nevada. So there's a lot of different resources and a lot of different moving parts um, that, 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 that need to happen for these discussions to, to happen, and I think you know, with the Nevada Indian Commission, I think we can definitely try to facilitate those conversations, you know, between the state agencies and between the tribes. So, so my question is, um, is there because it's the you know they're um, each sovereign nation, um, if they if the if that sovereign nation decides to um, to lease out part of their land. jurisdiction, you know, uh, the tribes control jurisdiction within the boundaries of their uh, of their lands. They can lease to any businesses that are non-Indian. We do that now, uh, my tribe. And so where you may run into issues or impasses is on taxes that are collected. You know, there's been challenges all the way through the Supreme Court. We, um, as you know, uh, one of the things I do is I, I chair the uh, taxation subcommittee for the National Congress of American Indians. And what that, what we've been trying to do is work out agreements with the states. As you know, here in the state of Nevada, we have an agreement with the state on collecting taxes. Now, it doesn't do any good for us to lease land on reservations to non-Indians and where the state would say, uh, send, send that tax money to the state, right? It doesn't make much sense, sense to do that. And so, in the state of Nevada, we have an agreement codified in the state law since 1990 where the state of Nevada has agreed that tribes can tax anybody, Indians or non-Indians, on tribal land. That's not like that all the way across the United States. Back in, the, uh, back in New York, they've been fighting tax issues all the way up to the Supreme Court. And, and you know, when you really think about it, the reason I got involved with uh, taxation issues, so it's not so much leasing the land, it's, it's how do you, how do you how do you create revenue off of, um, because you just be a leasing land, that's not very much money in there. And in the early 1990s, when I first became chairman, the question was, there were tribes that were living in poverty all the way from the Sioux Reservation to where there were 80% poverty rates, you know? And the issue there was, how come these tribes can't really create a, 
create a business and be able to keep the tax, whether or not it was Indians who frequented the stores or non-Indians, well, all the way to the Supreme Court, the states at that time said, if a non-Indian goes on to tribal land, frequents a store that's even owned by a tribe, they would have to take that money and send it to the state if it was a non-Indian customer. That seemed to be pretty ridiculous to me at that time. So in the 1990s, we entered into an agreement with the state so that anybody coming into Reno Sparks tribal stores or any of the Nevada stores, the tribes could keep that money so that we don't end up in a poverty rate like South Dakota or anywhere else. So we have a pretty good, uh, pretty good economy based on taxation. And so the idea was, how do cities and counties raise revenue? Well, they don't operate McDonald's, so they don't operate businesses. Basically, they operate off of taxes. And so ever since I started working in taxes, I felt that tribes should, since they're governments, they have to be able to collect taxes just like states and cities and counties. So a lot of my work over the year has, has actually been in tax work. So the question, we can lease land to anybody that's non-Indian on tribal land for businesses, but the big issue is always where does the tax money go? In the state of Nevada, it's pretty, pretty reasonable agreement. In other states, it's not like that. So hopefully, and we've tried for years to pass federal legislation to make it uh, uh, reasonable for tribes across the United States, but it's not like that. You have to take it state by state, and fortunately, we work with the uh, state legislature and the governor to have a pretty good agreement so that tribes have viable economies. And the idea is when tribes are strong because a dollar rolls off of the reservation into the surrounding communities. So uh, a lot of our work is along those lines. So that's, that's what we do. And so uh, we hope that we'll be able to continue to, to um, you know, be part of the community. So thank you. That kind of answers your question. Yes, You know, many of the tribes have a certain protocol uh, that that we honor the Aboriginal territory of where we are. For example, here it would be the, the Washoe tribe, since this is their Aboriginal territory, and basically we would ask permission to speak in on their land. Along, we went to Israel back in, we took a contingent from Canada and the United States and we protocoled in Israel because we were tribal nations that went to Israel. 
and even though they were all kind of people, tourists and everybody, and I think the Israel people, because we visited the Knesset and all these different places, but we never forgot the protocol. So when we went there and we met with the mayor of Jerusalem, I think at that time, we exhibited our, our protocol there, meaning that we asked them, the Jewish people, for permission for us to enter their land and that they would give us the right to speak and the right to enter their land. So there are many tribes that have protocol, and you're right, many of our many of our uh, tribes have that same protocol, whether we were up in Elko, it would be the Western Shoshone, and if it's near my tribe, you know, it would be our protocol. So at the beginning of the meeting, we would ask that tribe, how, would, how should we uh, uh, protocol the whole meeting? So I think you're right as far as that, and maybe that's something uh, we should continue to do. summer and we have had and they have loved going and watching the native dancers and the drummers and listening to the stories and um, if there was a way that we could know more about those kinds of things as well um, the other thing that I would like is I belong to a book group and we discuss a number of books and we've read books and how Indians are treated in certain books and things. I would love a list of books that we should read in terms of Indian history from a history perspective of the Indians. I think that would be just great um, information and we would be happy to share that. Again, thank you for doing this. Um, thank you, Marla, for meeting with us to uh, sort of design the evening, and it was very, very informative and very enlightening. And for those of you who might feel that you've missed something or want to see it again, again, our wonderful videographer will have this taped and put onto the Sierra Nevada Forms website so you can look at it again. Again, second Tuesday in October, and we will learn all about incredible medical research being done at UNR. Thank you again for coming. Appreciate it.